Hey, remember last week when a phishing attack led to a bunch of NPM packages getting infected with crypto stealer malware? Well, guess what? We have a new supply chain attack against NPM, and this one is... I mean, I can't not call it impressive. The attackers made a worm. Yes, a wormy boy in NPM. Thanks to Gab Smash for the name, by the way. Go follow her for sure. The malicious code being injected into packages not only steals credentials and other secrets, it's self-replicating. It will try to find valid NPM tokens on the system it's running on, use them to enumerate packages that the tokens have control over, and then update those packages with the malicious code. This is new. As far as I can tell, this is the first supply chain attack where malware attempts to self-replicate within the supply chain's core distribution system itself. It's still relatively early on. We don't know the full extent of this attack. I reached out to Charlie Erickson, a security researcher at Aikido Security, who has been researching this all day, and he'll be joining me a bit later in this video to answer a few questions. Before that, I'm going to briefly review some of the blogs that have been written about this attack. Okay, so I believe this is the first blog that kicked this all off from Socket's research team, uh, dated September 15th. So this actually all happened yesterday. Popular tiny color NPM package compromised in supply chain attack affecting 40 plus packages. And there is an update to this, uh, which I didn't see until I started recording this. But apparently, so when I started recording, there were only 180 something packages that were affected. Apparently this is up to 500 now. So we'll check out this second blog post in a moment. But there was basically a malicious update to Tiny Color, which is 2.2 million weekly downloads. That was detected as part of a broader supply chain attack that impacted more than 40 packages spanning multiple maintainers. So this was the initial 40 packages, I believe, that were compromised. So there's this bundle.js script which downloads and executes truffle hook. The truffle hog is, a, yeah, like it says, a legitimate secret scanner. So this is an actual tool used by security researchers. I've used this tool in the past. And basically what it does is you can use it to search through effectively almost anything, source code, HTTP responses, web pages, etc., for tokens. It's basically a token matching tool. And one of the core parts is you can actually use it to validate tokens. So if you can, you can basically see if they actually are valid or maybe they've expired, right? So this is one of the cool things about it. But they've effectively weaponized it sort of here, the, uh, the attacker. But yeah, it'll basically try and find a various types of credential. And specifically, it was looking for those NPM tokens as part of its sort of self-replication code. But yeah, this blog post doesn't have much in it in terms of the, the actual raw details. Uh, look, yeah, it says it's looking for GitHub tokens, NPM tokens, AWS access keys, and AWS secret access keys. So yeah, that's what effectively it was using Trufflehog to look for. So let's check out this follow-up blog post because again, this one uh, was pretty slim at the start. But this is the ongoing supply chain attack, also from Socket. Targets CrowdStrike NPM packages. Yes, CrowdStrike's NPM packages were compromised during this. But if we scroll down here, there is a huge list. So the following NPM packages and versions have been confirmed as affected. So yeah, this, this is crazy. Uh, so again, when I started recording this, I was under the impression it was still about 180. Uh, it is now 477. And this is going to increase because it's a worm. Every time one of these gets used, the potential for it to spread increases. Yeah, well done to the folks at Socket for effectively detecting this, writing this up. This is amazing. Uh, we're going to see the Aikido's blog post. Uh, so this is from Charlie Erickson, who I will be interviewing in a sec. But yeah, Singularity and NX attackers strike again. So. We actually know who the threat actors are, or at least we highly suspect uh, this is the same work as the threat actors behind the NX attack last month. And so, yeah, it, it effectively uses the same code, I believe, in terms of what it's actually searching for, which is the secrets. But this time it's doing a bit more. So it steals secrets and publishes them to GitHub publicly. It runs Trufflehawk, like we said before. 
and queries cloud metadata endpoints to gather secrets. It then attempts to create a new GitHub action with the data extraction mechanism through webhook.site. Now, a funny thing there is they were using a free account on webhook.site, which meant that they hit a, I think, 100 request limit, and then it just didn't work. So this, this bit is <laughs> kind of effectively neutered because webhook.site uh, isn't allowing them to connect anymore, which is kind of amusing. This is honestly one of the more serious things that it does. It iterates over the repositories on GitHub a user has access to and makes them public. So there are effectively now a huge number of private repos on GitHub that are now public, which is bad, right? The malware has been named Shy Halud. That is a reference to the name of the worms in the Dune franchise. It's been named that by the actual attackers. So effectively, when it would publish secrets to GitHub, it would create a repo called Shy Halud or some, some variation of that. So yeah, um, and obviously it is a worm, right? It's a worm malware. So yeah, kind of makes sense. What the worm does, it harvests secrets. Exfiltrates them via this GitHub uh, GitHub repo. Yeah, creates a repo named Shy Halud. Exfiltrates them via this webhook, which now does not work. Propagates. Uses any valid NPM tokens it finds to enumerate and attempt to update packages that compromise maintainer controls. And then amplifies. It iterates the victim's accessible repositories, making them public. So yeah, super detailed blog post here. It goes into a little bit more detail than the socket one. It also lists a bunch of packages, not as many as Socket, but I don't think this has been updated yet, and also several versions, right? So the problem with this malware is even if you patch a version, sometimes like it'll get reinfected. So yeah, that's how worms work. But yeah, let's check out another blog post by Wiz. This one doesn't go into too much detail, but what's important about this one is there is a huge section really on the actions that security teams can take. So they have quite a few good pieces of remediation advice here, including GitHub queries you can basically use to try and find if you're infected. Okay, so worth mentioning this blog post. And by the way, all blog posts I will link to in the video description as well. And finally, uh, this one from safety, getsafety.com. So this is a really super detailed deep dive into the actual code itself. We've got sort of the stuff like the JavaScript payload, right? And it basically goes over all of this code and tells you exactly what it's doing. So if you're really interested in the technical side of it, this blog post really good to read. You can see it looks like a lot of these, a lot of the scripts have been vibe coded. Uh, you can see from the uh, the emojis here. So that's kind of funny. But yeah, this one, yeah, so it goes over pretty much all the different stages at the code level and explains what the code is doing. And yeah, really, really useful blog post for those who want a little more, bit more of the, uh, the technical side of things. But now I'm going to talk to Charlie Erickson about some of the more details about this specific piece of malware. Charlie, welcome to my channel. We've seen numerous supply chain attacks against NPM. We had one last week that thankfully got caught early. Uh, you published a blog post a few days ago titled The Supply Chain Disaster That Almost Happened. Yes. Uh, tempting fate, kind of. Uh, but how bad is this? Well, honestly, when, when I published that blog post on Friday, what I more or less imagined was what we are seeing today, right? When when the whole attack against right debug and, and chalk happened, I was like, if they had used the same techniques as that as the attackers that compromised the NX packages, right? They could have really done some damage. What we ended up seeing is actually maybe even worse. I hadn't quite imagined the worming part of it, but uh, here we are. So, can you walk us through? how this attack works and what makes it different from supply chain attacks we've seen before? Yeah, so what happened is that, and we're not really 100% sure yet, it seems like there was this one package that got compromised with this piece of malware. And the thing that is really interesting about this one specifically is that it has the capability to propagate itself like a worm, right? So if you remember back to like the the 2000s, right, with like config and all of these like classic like spam worms that goes around by email, stuff like that. This does the same, 
right? So it will, once it's on a machine and installed, it will see, does it have a NPM token? And if it does, it will go and look up on NPM, what packages do I have access to to publish to? It'll take the 20 most popular packages by download count. It's gonna download them to the local machine, unpack the packets, drop in itself into the packets, wrap it back up and upload it to NPM. On top of that, it's gonna do just like we saw with NX uh, singularity attack originally back at the end of, was it September, August, something like that. It's gonna go through and find any GitHub credentials you have, right? Your personal access token. And if it finds that, it's gonna go and take all of the credentials it can find on your machine, both environment variables, but also now using Trufflehawk, which is a great tool for legitimate reasons. And it's gonna drop that all into a new GitHub repository called, and I'm like, we're gonna try to pronounce it, some sort of dune worm thing. Yeah, it's gonna make that public. It's also gonna see what private repositories do you have, and it's gonna flip them all. Well, not quite flip, but it's gonna switch them all to public. So we got a proper right. Robin Hood <laughs> style, like smash and grab and just make it all available. Uh, and then this whole GitHub action thing, which is less interesting, but still, yeah, there's another little cute attack vector that they try to do to persist and leak more credentials. That's crazy. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are focusing, obviously, on the, the worming aspect is honestly impressive. Yes. Uh, but sort of, you can't overlook that this is actual malware that's actually trying to do something. It's trying to expose a lot of credentials, uh, which is, yeah, which is the dangerous part of this entire thing. Yeah, I mean, when when the NX attack originally happened, I was really, I, I thought we got lucky a little bit, right? Because the amount of credentials we saw leaking is just unreal. And I was like, okay, what are they going to do with it? And we didn't really see a lot, it felt like, right? And there were some mm. suggestions that maybe NPM and GitHub had rotated as many as they could, right? Because they obviously know what was posted but I'm actually not sure if that's the case. I, I don't think there's really been a clarification on what happened there. But maybe what happened in this case is that they actually kept some of those credentials and then did a second round, right? Because at least with what they had, there were so many opportunities from, to sort of cause more ripples. Mm. And, and that's now, well, so what we did see in the original attack was that after a little bit of a period of time, the people that were impacted by this they started to have the GitHub repositories also turned public. But it was not a part of the original malware initially. But now we're seeing it embedded and just, you know, it does it on its own. So yeah, now we're really in a sticky situation because this moves so fast that the big risk we are facing now is that we, we are at this point in time, it's like 8 p.m. you know, here in Amsterdam right now. And we haven't really seen any new repositories pop up for a couple of hours. We haven't seen any packages popping up for uh, at least four or five hours, I think. But that can change really quickly, right? If anything happens overnight and just the wrong person does something, like installs a package that is still compromised, uh, you can get a super spreader event where suddenly if, if somebody with a really important package gets compromised, we're mm. going to have a round two and we're going to have a round three. And that's scary, right? There's no way of containing this outside of NPM doing something drastic in principle. Yeah. And and you did raise almost the same point on X uh, a few hours ago that because this is self-replicating, it could lay dormant for for a while and then just start spreading again. Uh, so like you said, NPM clearly have to do something, but what? So this, and this is where it gets really tricky, right? I talked to uh, Josh Junan, the guy behind Debug and Chalk last week. We did a really cool interview, it was like a 45 minute interview about his experience with this uh, and kind of what he would s suggest would happen to try to mitigate this. I wrote my kind of checking that out. But I think there's a couple of things in terms of sort of the kill chain that you could look at, right? One is this idea that we have long lived tokens for publishing packages, mm. right? I think that idea needs to die at some point, if I'm honest, right? Yeah. That just can't be happening anymore, right? And that's going to be a long-term thing, right? We can't just turn them off overnight. People will get mad for good reasons. But that needs to change at some point, I think. 
Uh, the second one is, uh, and it's not specifically for for this incident, but what we saw last week, right, with the two point seven billion. I, I can't talk anymore. Um, we might need to look at having phishing resistant uh, two factor authentication for npm. Mm. Also, the fact that packages can get pushed so quickly and end up in real systems within minutes. That's an issue, right? Because we can't keep up with that, right? There's no way trust does not propagate at machine speed. Trust yeah. takes time and, and open source is based on trust. And I think P and PM realized this because just, I think it was today they announced a new feature in P and PM where you can say, hey, don't install any new version that is less than this amount of time old, mm. right? So if you say, hey, I'm not going to install a package that's or like a package version that's less than 24 hours, you're going to, you're going to prevent a lot of this from happening. And of course, right. People shouldn't be having like open, like floating, uh, version specifications in the packets adjacent and use package log files and things like that. But ultimately, right. The, the further up the chain of like, even getting it to a place where it's just really difficult to get a malicious package out, like a into the supply chain as it exists, that's a better situation because then we can focus on how do we prevent people from actually just submitting really obviously malicious code to NPM to begin with, right? And that's a much easier problem than trying to figure out like, when do we lose trust in a package because of the code that's deployed? Yeah. So I know Aikido have a free NPM wrapper called SafeChain that yes. scans for malicious packages. But what other advice do you have specifically for developers to protect themselves and their code? Yeah, it's it's a difficult thing, right? Because the the fact that like the, the reality of writing code is that you're going to try to get something working as quickly as you can and then hope it's good enough, right? And then you move on to the next thing. Uh, yeah, you can use things like SafeChain and, and there's a lot of other tools like it that will help you, but it's not a 100% fix. What will help you is try to minimize dependencies as much as you can. Be really mindful about which ones you include. Just be careful about not upgrading packages unless you really need to, right? Fix them as much as you can. Use the package lock files. And, and frankly, right now, NPM is a war zone. I... I am not writing JavaScript or TypeScript even anymore right now, just because like I, I, I see this on a daily basis, right? I see how much crap is going through there and you don't see half of it. We're getting 6,000 packages a month and that's a lot. And mm. it takes so little, small mistake and yeah, you're, you're toast. We need a cultural change around the ecosystem. I think that's really where we need to push as a community of like actually making sure that the ecosystem itself is not, it, we can't let status quo continue, right? As professionals, this is not okay, right? That's I think where in the, in the medium term, certainly, right? Short term use safe chain, these kind of tools, but that's not a reason to not be very clear about like, we can't be this relaxed about this. Yeah. No, I 100% I agree. And Charlie, thank you so much for joining me today. I, I, hope, I hope you get a good night's sleep and I hope yes. nothing disastrous happens uh, this evening. Fingers, Fing crossed. fingers crossed, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you so much again. Thanks for having me. That's all I have right now. Will we see another NPM attack next week? Well, you can find out by subscribing to my channel because I'll probably make another video about it. If you enjoyed this one, please give it a like and leave your thoughts in the comments. Until next time, happy hacking.